Uh, so we were really excited when Michelle approached us about coming into um, this session today to share our framework, but more importantly, talk about this really important kind of uh, big picture uh, topic around partnering with patients, uh, families and caregivers um, for integrated care. And so our, our engagement capability framework, as, as Michelle said, was released uh, back in June. Um, we It's been around, it's been disseminated, but as always with these things, it's better to kind of have a session, a, a dedicated session to give you a bit of a sense of, of what the framework's about and how it can help you with this very uh, important work. So I'm going to just focus on three um, key objectives, um, just to give you a, a a sense of how the, the session is going to go this morning. First one is really to just remind ourselves of, of and, and, and appreciate the value of, of doing this work, this engagement, this partnership work with patients, uh, family members and caregivers, and how it can help your governance work, your leadership, your collaborative leadership work, and, and how to approach this um, in your OHT. The second key objective is, is obviously to, to share our framework with you and talk specifically about how we think the elements of the framework can be helpful in this work. And then most importantly, uh, and this is where uh, my co-presenters come in, uh, we are going to have you uh, hear from three different OHTs uh, and their perspectives um, on how they've uh, uh, thought about and approached the involvement of patient, family members and caregivers in their um, collaborative decision making work. So, and if I could just ask again, maybe for the muting um, for everybody so that I'm not hearing the feedback. Um, thanks very much. I thought she did. And my my co-presenters um, who you'll hear hear from in, in a short um, a few minutes are, are coming from three different OHTs. And I think what we'll do is, is introduce them when we get to that part of the presentation. So just to set some context here, and again, likely all of you are very familiar with you know, how we got here in terms of OHT development, but I think just a reminder that patient partnership and community engagement is one of the, the, the uh, building blocks um, for OHT development, building block three. And within that, uh, when we think about collaborative decision-making, um, it is to be informed by patients, by family members and caregivers, right? And, and that there is an expectation for very direct, very you know, explicit involvement of patient, family members and caregivers in decision-making. But the how, I think, is very much left to OHD discretion. And that's a big, important gap, right, is, is how do we do that, right? It's one thing to, to ask for it and to expect it, but to do that is, is a whole other matter. And I think, you know, about a year ago when the Path Forward guidance came out, we, we got a little bit more of a sense of even more explicit um, identification of, of the importance of this, uh, that there should be a role for PFCs in OHT um, leadership and in OHT decision making. And again, you know, very specific language in the Path Forward document around this. And I think it's also important as part of our background and context setting for this to just remember, you know, the why, like what, wh why, why is um, this a building key bl building block for OHG development? Why is um, the centering of, of, of patient family members and caregivers in uh, OHG so important and for the, you know, goal of, of achieving integrated care? A um, couple of points on this, or at least three points on this, that importantly, health systems belong to all of us, right? But in particular, they belong to citizens, to, to taxpayers, to health and social services users, to our communities, right? So there's just a, a very important um, kind of imperative for this, that given that this is for us, with us, you know, about us, it seems reasonable, quite reasonable, in fact, to think that we would do this work with uh, with us, right? With, with citizens, with taxpayers, with our, ourselves as patients, uh, family members, and caregivers. I think I've put this... Um, uh, cover of the British Medical Journal from about 2010 up on this slide, because I think it really also reflects an important consideration here, this, this idea of the patient revolution. Um, I know some people's reaction to that may be kind of sort of confrontational, but I think what it does is it set us, sets our expectations, right? That, that this group, PFCs, patients, family members, caregivers, really play a central role uh, in our health systems and should do so, right? And so it's no longer the case of this sort of hierarchical, maybe more paternalistic approach to health systems, but in fact, you know, this is all about uh, uh, patient-centered care, we we hope uh, and, and we expect. And so including uh, PFCs, um, you know, in, in, in their care, in direct care at the governance level makes, makes a lot of sense. And that there are also really good reason, good reasons for doing this from a quality of care and health outcomes perspective, not just for the sake of doing this um, because people want to be there and want to have that uh, central role, but in fact, 
we have evidence to uh, that points to improved quality of care, improved health outcomes when we do this work in this way. So while it's easy to call for this and to kind of you know make the case, it's, it's not so easy to do. Oh, um, things things that challenges just challenges the status quo yeah. uh, for yeah. some. You know, for some, so this, this is concerns about power sharing. If I could ask you to mute yourself, please. Again, thank you. Um, it's different cultures and practices uh, across different organizations um, sometimes you know generate some conflicts around this or some tensions some partner organizations are very comfortable with you know involvement of, of uh, community members uh, in in uh, uh, key leadership positions in organizations some have less experience with this or perhaps less of a comfort level with it. I think also it's important to recognize that the tensions that are surfaced between maybe more technocratic ways of thinking about governance and leadership versus more democratic approaches. And of course, at the root of it all is also some uncertainty, right, about how to do this well. What are the skills, the competencies and, and enablers that are uh, needed to do this work well? And that's really what this webinar is all about as a first step, as Michelle said, an entry point into this, an overview, uh, and then hopefully you'll surface some questions, some um, challenges you're facing, some kind of maybe burning issues that you're grappling with that we can tackle maybe a little bit today, start to uh, uh, surface those, and then in subsequent sessions, um, be able to tackle them in more depth. So how do we start to walk the talk, right? So I think first of all, recognizing that it's not just about bringing people to the table, um, maybe that's just the the very first step is to think about how do we do that, and even that, you know, requires you know some careful thinking and navigation. But then, of course, learning how we come together and work together effectively for for collective impact. And importantly, right, this is all about culture, right? This is about building a culture of trust, right, within uh, OHTs and uh, all of your partner organizations, open communication and reciprocity, right, and and very much rooted in. In, in core principles, principles of, of centering, right? All of the engagement, the partnership work uh, around inclusive practices, around equity, and, and of course, recognizing the centrality in all of this of patients, families, and caregivers in, as, as part of the core mission of OHTs. So perhaps a lot of this is, you know, quite familiar to you. You want to, you know, let's move on into some of the um, more detailed kind of thinking about how do we approach this. So we did a little bit of a scan um, to, to try to get a handle on how OHTs are currently approaching the involvement of uh, PFCs in their decision-making uh, activities. And so what we found is, is summarized here. And, and so perhaps not surprisingly, about 80% of OHTs have patient and family advisory committees or PFACs. Um, or they're in the process of developing one. I think it's important to recognize that a PFAC doesn't equal involvement in governance decisions. PFACs are there, but in some cases, you know, they're they're quite separate and they're very much in that advisory role and they don't actually have a, a role, a place at the decision-making table. So important to recognize that. Uh, under half publicly report, and again, this was based on, on, on availability of, of this information, uh, under half publicly report having PFC partners ranging from one to three um, at the decision-making table. Some have always included them, uh, have from the get-go in, in setting up their OHTs. They have a, a, a PFC partner as one of the co-leads. Um, we are seeing more of that now that it's a requirement, of course. And in, in, I would say in a handful, a very small number, um, that P PFC partner is identified as a co-lead, a co-chair or a tri-chair. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that model from one of our presenters in, in a few minutes. And then about a third um, identify a staff member who's responsible, who's most responsible for supporting all of the PFC partnership and engagement work. And I put that there because, as you'll hear in a little in a little bit, staff support is a key enabler to all of this. It's really hard to do this um, without actually having some some uh, staff support there to to kind of guide this, to do that li important liaison work with PFC partners, um, to make sure that there's some real you know thoughtful approaches to this and and uh, often this happens within the role of the communications and engagement lead. So a little bit of an overview of, of kind of what we found out there. Um, and of course, you're going to hear a little bit, a lot more detail from our uh, OHT presenters um, ab about how they uh, look at this and how they have uh, structured um, uh, this into their own um, organizations. So 
a few other kind of high level points um, before we move on into the, the details of, of the uh, how OHTs are, are tackling this currently. Um, if we think about including PFC partners in decision making, um, there are obviously key considerations to be made. And again, all of you who are thinking about involved to any extent with you know, setting up committees, structures, will understand good, good board practice, right? Practices around good board functioning. And that usually includes thinking about the models and structures that you're going to put in place. So what does that organizational structure look like? And how is decision making going to happen? And what feeds into it? What are the inputs to it? When you think about putting your, your decision making uh, committees together, you're thinking about what size, you know, how big is it going to be? What's the composition? What kind of uh, uh, array of skills, experiences and qualities do we want to have around the table? You're going to recruit um, for these skills, experiences, qualities, et cetera. Uh, lots of things to think about around recruitment of PFC partners in particular, which you'll hear about uh, as well from our OHT uh, um, members. Uh, orientation and, and education supports. And then of course, at that you know key leadership level, right? To what, to what role will PFC uh, partners have at that leadership level? And, and thinking about ongoing monitoring assessment and evaluation to make sure we're, we're capturing and understanding what we're doing and how well we're doing it. And so that we can uh, adjust uh, as we go. We thought this would be helpful to kind of start to get you into thinking about maybe more practically, you know, what this might look like. And so, the different approaches that you might take to uh, pulling your, your boards, your decision-making structures together will have some in influence on, on how PFC roles and functions will be shaped. So we put kind of these two broad ways of thinking about boards, skill-based boards and representative boards together to, to, to just compare and contrast a little bit. If we look at the skill-based boards, um, here the emphasis is, is your, your patient, family, caregiver, partners are there more you know, there for more than just their lived experiences, right? They have other skills, they have other expertise, they have other, you know, professional, all kinds of other uh, things that they bring to their role beyond just, you know, I'm a patient, I'm a caregiver for X, Y, Z. That encourages broader participation of PFC partners. If you're thinking about them as more than just their lived experience, they may be brought in for, for other things as well. I think with that though, a, a bit of a caveat that you need to pay attention to the balancing of, a sufficient diversity of lived experience, like you don't want to lose that because you're so excited about the other skills your patient partners bring, you don't want to lose your your kind of uh, initial, you know, uh, uh, involvement of them because of their lived experience. And you want to still try to capture a diversity or a range of lived experiences and those lived experiences perspectives. So a little bit of balancing um, to think about or pay attention to. And when we look at the, the the more kind of representative boards, of course, this helps ensure that boards, you know, will will reflect the attributed population for your OHTs. Uh, ensures um, that a minimum, you know, number of P PFC partners are there because you've really thought about, okay, we want to bring in, you know, PFC partners for this particular reason to represent or reflect certain uh, characteristics of or or you know of the population. But then that you know raises a whole host of other challenges, like. So how do we choose them, right? And we know that often uh, OHGs are, are facing challenges in thinking about how they how they do that work, how they reflect, how they represent um, their populations. I think it can also limit the ability to draw on, um, you know, a broader range of experiences. Again, in in sort of contrast to what we just talk, talked about with the skill based board. So perhaps that's a helpful way of starting to unpack this and think about, you know, how how do we approach um, bringing or involving uh, PFC partners. Uh, in our um, uh, governance activities. And, you know, sort of the, the whole act of bringing people together, right, is really just the starting point. Um, obviously, moving on from that, you need to start thinking about how do we build those effective working relationships that are going to have collective impact. A couple of things around this idea of authentic collaboration, right? Again, perhaps not you know, particularly new or, or novel for, for, for many of you, but just to, to remind ourselves that this is a lot about relationships, right? And nurturing those relationships that are based on mutual trust and respect. And I think particularly with uh, developing relationships with patient family caregiver partners, that's that's exceptionally uh, important uh, and, and particularly important because of issues around vulnerabilities, issues around power or sense of, you know, uh, not being kind of on a level playing field. So really important to think about this, especially with respect to patient, family, caregiver, partners. 
So thinking uh, uh, about all of these different ways that we start to build kind of those uh, that authentic, respectful collaborations. And what we see um, as a, a really helpful support for this is to think about your organizations as create engagement capable environments. And so if we think about creating or building these en engagement capable environments to support this work, that's going to be a key you know, and helpful step uh, towards uh, moving in in a really positive direction with your your collaborative leadership and 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 governance activities. And so now, what I'm going to do is move very quickly through an introduction, very much a high level introduction. We kind of asked you to to look at this ahead of time, so we hope you've done that. So I'm going to move through this very quickly because we want now want to move on to uh, hear from our OHT um, uh, presenters. So this. This engagement capable environment work um, was really uh, developed to provide an accessible kind of how to framework, a very practical framework to guide uh, partnership and engagement work across OHTs. It was importantly co-designed with PFC partners, one of whom is with us uh, uh, co-presenting today, Lacha Hives from Nipissing Wellness, with OHT staff and leadership as well, representatives from the Ministry of Health and, and also uh, built up through extensive consultation. <clears throat> and it includes, as you'll see, uh, a range of competencies, supports, enablers with links to resources for each element, as well as a maturity model framework to help you think about, you know, where you should be early on, maybe as you're you're moving along with your developmental work, and then uh, at maturity. And so, very uh, at a very basic level, if you look at this visual here, it shows two rings, right? An inner ring, uh, which uh, identifies six competency domains and an outer ring, which identifies four supports and enabler domains. So the idea is that, you know, while individuals might need have developed competencies in areas, those competencies at an individual level can't really be sustained without the important enablers and supports at the organizational level. So we thought a capability framework really needs to have two dimensions to it, that competency dimension, as well as the support, supportive and, and, and enabling uh, uh, function as well. So this is what helps OHTs to put partnership and engagement at the center of their work. Uh, and again, also it emphasizes collective responsibility, right? It's This is about everyone's responsibility. Often we hear that PFC partners are feeling like they're responsible for doing all this work. That's not appropriate. That's not okay. Uh, this is the collective responsibility of everybody uh, within the OHT to support this work. And so very briefly, with, we're going to start with the six um, uh, competency domains and just kind of a high level, really uh, touching on um, the elements of these moving clockwise around that inner ring. So the first two uh, capture this whole important idea of really understanding OHT rules and functions. So as PFC partners are brought into their work with OHTs, they actually need to understand what an OHT is what the community or attributed population is, a lot of basic just kind of nuts and bolts of, of what the OHT is about. I think sometimes that gets lost in the excitement of, you know, finding a PFC partner and bringing them into the work. We forget that there's a whole lot of onboarding orientation, you know, just a bit broad understanding that needs to happen uh, in their roles. And of course, the, the, a lot of what we've been talking about already around recognizing the value of all of this, right? So I'm not going to talk about that in a whole lot of detail. But those are the two competent, first two competency domains covered in the framework, <clears throat> followed by the next two, which really get into how do we do this work effectively, right? How do we, what do we mean by partnership engagement? What, what does that actually look like, right, on the ground in practice? What are the principles and approaches required to do this work? inauthentic, in respectful, in, in reciprocal ways? What are those core requirements? And again, all of that supported by res key resources in with that are embedded in the framework. And then uh, clearly of, of great importance uh, along the way in this work is the uh, integration of equity, diversity, inclusion principles, sometimes referred to as DEI, um, that have to be brought into and embedded in all of the uh, partnership and engagement work. So understanding what those key concepts mean, how to actually practice them, uh, what you know, how do they get applied for different populations and communities, understanding what accessibility requirements are, a whole array of, of principles that uh, need to be understood and, and understood how they are practiced. And then a final, uh, the final two uh, competency domains focus on really more of the personal uh, characteristics and communication skills. Our, our working group who uh, developed this framework felt that it was extremely important to flag 
the personal characteristics needed to support this work along with the particular communication skills that are required to do this work very effectively. So again, um, um, capturing this just at a very high level at this point, but encourage you to look at these uh, in more detail on, on your own. And then looking now at the outer ring, so we have those four supports and enablers. And again, not, not a big surprise that you've got to have your policies and strategies in place for how you're going to demonstrate this clear commitment to partnership and engagement and, and, and how that's actually uh, uh, developed or, or uh, borne out uh, in your, your work, those foundational elements, what are your communication strategies, uh, all of the structures and processes. And I think that's where we start to get into uh, some of the, the thinking about how do we bring those PFC uh, partners into the collaborative decision-making structures. And you're going to hear about that in a couple of minutes. And then importantly, <clears throat> supporting all of this work with learning and exchange opportunities, right? And developmental opportunities. So people need, people are are not, you know, static. This isn't just a, I've learned it, now I do it forever. And it's always the same way. People actually <clears throat> develop. They uh, need to develop <clears throat> further skills in this area. Uh, there's a lot of, of support and capacity building uh, that's required in this. And again, from all parties, not just the PFC partners, but from leadership, engagement staff, all the way uh, through. Um, so those are, uh, it, that's a bit of a snapshot of the uh, the framework. And we're hoping to, to hear from you about what you want to hear more uh, on from us about that. Uh, and I'm now going to move on into our practical session, uh, which is to hear from the uh, OHTs. And so we have first up, we have Lacha Hives from Nipissing Wellness, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, how her OHT has approached um, uh, bringing uh, the PFC voice and, and perspectives into their uh, collaborative decision making, then followed by Dean Valentine from uh, Downtown East Toronto OHT, and then finally, uh, Lindsay Wingham-Smith from Mississauga OHT. And each in different uh, roles, uh, the first two in in patient family caregiver roles and and Lindsay in a in a leadership role. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to you, Lacha, and uh, you just uh, tell me when you want me to move your slides. <laughs> thanks so much. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Julia. Um, so I am a patient family caregiver representative and uh, tri chair on uh, Nipissing Wellness Ontario Health Team. And I hope you don't mind, but I do have my notes that I'll I'll uh, follow along with to keep me um, on the on. Uh, a path because we have just so much time this morning. So very briefly, in my semi-retirement, um, I was looking to be uh, to share my optimistic pr perspective from my care journey with my dear mom, who has now since passed away, and I wanted to make a difference. So sometimes your patient family caregivers will come to you. This work is messy and iterative, and when patient family caregiver partners join in, they may have questions and having mentorship in diverse ways, because we're all different and unique, so paying attention to those kinds of things helps each person to build a relationship with the people who are at the heart of this work. And um, I became familiar with how the task and working groups functioned. I found my voice, and with encouragement from an outgoing member, this is important too, and another co-chair on our Patient Family Caregiver Council, I became a co-chair with our Patient Family Caregiver Council. I could bring my experiences and also my system leadership skill set because I come from the world of education, um, which was a wonderful new challenge for me. Um, PFC partners can offer unique and innovative community partnership ideas, especially when they have connections beyond healthcare in their communities and even across the province. So that's another advantage. Having thoughtful patient family caregiver representation on key decision-making structures, like hiring task groups and in interviews, also brings fresh perspective. That's what we want, is to be thinking differently. A flexible, focused, responsive, collective approach allows the system to serve and be served more efficiently and effectively. There's a shared uh, accountability and ownership for system delivery and the health of our communities. <clears throat> and I stress the hour, it's the shared ownership, helping every PFC partner, staff member and health partner as unique individuals, as Julia was speaking to, to feel valued and to be encouraged to contribute and thrive is a responsibility that's really owned by everyone in the OHT. And it should feel like that when you come on board. We help each other to feel valued seen and heard in this collective and iterative work 
This is the mission statement, the vision, and how the OHT business needs to function for it, for it to get legs under itself. Next slide, please. Thank you, Julia. So we're encouraged to stay in a reflective practitioner's stance. So we reflect, consider all of the conversations and spaces where patients, families, and caregivers can contribute perspective, seek clarification, row shared understandings, set direction, and lead next steps for the communities served by your OHT. So you have to come at it being curious and open. The path forward sets the context, it's the why, and then <clears throat> it's why we involved patients, family, caregivers in our collective decision-making. The initial concept of our Nipsing Wellness OHT envisioned partnership and engagement of patients, families, and caregivers and sought representation right from the onset, even before I got there. And at this time, our OHT chose, OHT, sorry, chose to move to a tri-chair model for our steering committee we call Collaboration Council. I had the privilege to move into this inaugural role with the encouragement of our council, and I could bring my understandings of how I knew the OHT functioned at the local level and at the provincial level. I think that's important, right, to understand how everything works and is connected. As partners, OHT members, including PFC members, weigh in on all collaborative communications. So graphics, for example, what you see here, documents, website, social media, with a keen eye on how communications might be perceived by community members. This graphic encircles the patient family caregivers as our shared purpose at the center. Collaboration Council is our steering committee. We have a PFC council with typically eight to 10 members, two of whom are co-chairs. I think that's important. Rather than a chair, having two always are challenging each other's bringing fresh perspective. And they're there for a two to three year term. Ideally, two patient family caregiver representatives contribute to each task group, each working group and committee. Updates are provided to patient family caregiver council itself and then feedback as requested is also brought back to the task groups, to the working groups and to the committees. So it's that reciprocity that Julia was speaking about. Because we have several smaller rural and Northern communities being served by our OHT, you'll see in the graphic, uh, we have co-designed health hubs to ensure that smaller communities retain a strong voice in decision-making. Equity Council includes patient family caregiver partners, staff, health partners, and where possible, diverse representation of our community demographics. And we reach out to the community as well through focus groups. Collaboration Council is our steering and decision-making body that meets monthly. There are approximately 30 or more OHT partners who are voting members. We have two voting patient family caregiver representatives on Collaboration Council, myself, the tri-chair, and the co-chair of the council. And all other PFC members are welcome to, or partners are welcome to attend. We use consensus decision-making, and we really work through that process, what it would look like for voting members. And typically there are 15 to 25 members in attendance at a meeting. We have an executive lead, and are in the process of hiring a new staff member with the responsibilities for patient family caregiver partnership and community engagement. This is essential and important that the title speaks to the responsibilities as uh, we have a, that we value as an OHT and that are central to our vision and our shared purpose. We have a tri-chair model because we as an OHT believe in co-design and the patient family caregiver partnership in all aspects of the organization. Our tri-chair structure includes one representative with system organizational experience, one as a representative of primary care, and one as a patient family caregiver representative. We meet together with the executive lead to prepare for collaboration council meetings and review priorities. Tri chairs take turns chairing meetings, so myself included, and leading consensus decision making. And we are co leaders, and our executive lead supports each of us in differentiated ways. Again, that flexibility, you know, how do we help people support them how they need to 
uh, how they feel they need to be supported. I've always felt respected and appreciated for the perspective, experience, and unique personal approach I offer to leadership by my fellow tri-chairs, our executive lead, and by the other OHT members. Rather than a hierarchy, mutual respect is key and a spirit of generosity serves us well. We are all always learning with and from each other and being curious, all of us, is essential. And I'm wondering if maybe we can have the Nipissing Wellness uh, website in the chat, please. And thank you, Laura. And Julie, if I could have the next slide, please. So take time to recognize. So uh, yes, take time to recognize that each PFC partner is on their own care journey. That's so important. You know, need we need to create the structures and menu of opportunities that invite them to contribute in whatever capacity they feel is manageable at any given time. And that changes, right? That fluctuates. Each and every patient family caregiver who is providing their time, lived experiences and personal expertise is coming to this health care transformation, believing they can influence for the betterment of all. That's with why they're there. Acknowledge the people in this work. Celebrate their strengths and gifts so they feel seen and heard and valued. Not to check off a box and get something done, but that they've personally left us thinking in new and different ways. Co-design is a solid and ever-improving framework. Co sorry, co-design a solid and ever-improving framework. Scaffolding and thoughtful processes owned by the collective OHT membership, which enables the people in the collective to feel supported. Partnering and engaging with patient family caregiver representatives is dynamic, fluid, and constantly evolving with people coming in and out. That's important too, right? Constantly. So there's that bringing people on board and helping to, them to feel confident on how things are working. They're dipping in and out. A flexible growth mindset is key. Patient family caregiver recruitment, Julia referred to this, is the responsibility of the full OHT membership with staff, not patient family caregiver council members alone. This ensures that there's a continual uptake and intentional reaching out from all health partner member organizations and a more fulsome representation across the communities we all serve. OHTs benefit and flourish with the promotion of RISE Patient Family Caregiver Partnership and Engagement Community of Practice Resources. That's quite a mouthful. And I'm wondering if Laura doesn't mind putting that link in the, the chat for those who might not know of it yet. Share that, demonstrate it, pull things up in meetings so that people become familiar with those resources, which have been developed with patient family caregiver perspective. This particular framework that we're talking about today, the framework for action, knits together the conditions, the enablers, and the competencies that are the backbone to give structure to the work of the OHT. It gives all the partners, health and patient family caregiver, and staff the shared knowledge, language, and understandings, the foundation or the garden upon which to build and grow. Take notice not to have a patient family caregiver tri-chair in name only. And I have heard of this from uh, in some situations where it's almost as if the work that is done and the contribution, contribution that's made is dismissed when someone else comes along. So not in name only. If we see patient family caregivers as partners, no decisions are made without their perspective and voice. Listening, observing and reflecting is key. Helping to celebrate growth and to slow down the process to reflect and rethink is essential. Notice voices that are not present in the conversation yet. Reflecting on the process, learning as we go, making the change that we need to see happen, and then reflecting again to see if there's been a positive collective impact. It's an iterative cycle. One essential condition for continual improvement is the collaboratively revisiting the policies and terms of reference. They're not static, so important. They serve to scaffold improvement and require revisiting and to challenge the status quo locally and provincially. And this framework is the tool to support this process and is responsive to where each OHT is at any given time on their journey. Thanks so much for this opportunity this morning. 
Great. Thanks so much, Lacha. Um, lots, lots of uh, things to think about in, in your remarks. Um, we're going to move now, just in the interest of time, to, to have our two other speakers um, uh, share their perspectives. So, Dean, Dean, can I ask you to uh, to go ahead with yours? And I'm happy to move your slides along as well. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, so, uh... I'm very grateful to have kind of the opportunity to to speak and to uh, I always say that uh, my experience in the downtown East Toronto is really a collaborative experience because from the start, we uh, as family uh, caregivers and patients were strongly represented in our vision and principles. And that was a collective thing done. So I think first and foremost is we're looking at currently uh, for myself uh, having experience of two years before approval for the H uh, for the OHT and we're almost a little bit over the two-year mark as an approved OHT and uh, our initial engagement structure was to have a co-design approach so uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is just that current approach and the collaborative decision making we had a, we have a CDMA that uh, that we involve patient family and caregivers at all levels of leadership so that we're entwined in there and I, the next slide I'll show you that uh, the community advisory council here uh, just a, I'm going to say a couple of months ago, and Julia, if you just go back to the previous slide, what we did is we did a call to action. And the call to action was just uh, for the team members and the team members within the Downtown East Toronto OHT are those signed organizations. They represent 39 different uh, organizations within the Downtown East Toronto um, they are healthcare settings, uh, hospitals, and uh, community uh, organizations that work in community health type approaches. So it's a real holistic body of people. So those team members uh, are represented on a leadership table and the leadership table is our core table. So the call to action was for that core table and the team members to make community engagement a priority. and fulfill the responsibility to the OHT model to have patients, family, and caregivers equitably represented in further co-design development leadership and the Downtown East OHT overall engagement. There's challenges and successes and lessons learned. And uh, I'm going to say some of the successes were that we did a, uh, a PFC engagement survey an experience survey in the spring. And uh, we recognized some of the strengths were in creating safe space, uh, people feeling that their voice was heard, people seeing that their voice and their opinions and their strategies were actually uh, within the work and initiatives that the downtown East were doing. So that was great. And Julia, just the next slide. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of re reinforce uh, that in kind of original uh, kind of the original structure and the original strategy, I guess, is the word I'm trying to use. Uh, so just taking a look at the organizational structure here is really important in we do have the team members and those are the 39 uh, different organizations. We have that core group, which is about 15 of those. And that core group is the leadership table or what we would call a board. And there's two seats for community members, for patient, family, and caregivers. So that's kind of what I, I, I look at it as the executive table, if you looked at old traditional structures. So they're equal team members at that board. And then we have the Community Advisory Council. And the Community Advisory Council, we currently have six. Uh, we want a complement of 12, but they're supported by the OHT operational staff. So they're supported, however, kind of work independently. And we take a look at what the core table uh, strategies are 
and we work alongside those strategies. I always say about 80% of our time is to work with the core table, the initiatives, their priorities. And then there's that 20% of our time that looks at gaps and looks at what we could further do and try to address those issues. But I think one of the, the strengths of the model we have here is our engagement working group, which uh, you can see on my screen, it's at the left, so at the left of the screen here. And that's an engagement working group that is provider and patient uh, collaboration. So it's meant to be a table that is, again, supported by the OHT uh, operational staff, but there is representation at that working group from both community members and the providers. We try to have a community organization bring in a community member, and then they work in this mentorship. And I always say a mentorship works both ways. So while the provider is mentoring that uh, patient family caregiver, uh, the patient family caregiver is indeed mentoring the organization as well, and they're supporting each other. And that engagement uh, working group works with overall engagement strategies and overall involvement. And then within this slide, you'll see here as well, these are some of the initiatives and the other working groups we have. So the, uh, the intent is to ensure that we have consistent and permanent patient family caregiver representative on each one of these working groups. And depending on the size of the working group, then that representation, if it's a larger group, you should have two or three or more patient family caregivers. It's a smaller one, one or two. And while some of the patient family caregivers work in different areas and different kind of initiatives, we want to make sure that we have broad voices and we want to open that up. So uh, because we represent a large part of the population and a diverse population, we want to make sure that that organically kind of uh, represents the attributed population of the downtown East Toronto. Uh, and Julia, just the next slide. So I guess what I want to emphasize here, uh, the uh, the fan art approach is always good to look at where, where, where we're working and what we're doing. But I think the approach to the representation in governance activity and different parts of leadership is to, to highlight, to ensure that you have representation kind of on that leadership board. So uh, I used to always say that I, I felt really comfortable uh, as an equal team member, but recognizing how that developed through the way as being an equal and equitable team member. So sometimes needing uh, extra time to feel validated or to ensure that my point of view was looked at in, 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 in the way that it was tended in kind of this leadership table. I, I think I was always welcomed. I was always given space to speak, but there were times when it was just as a patient or a family and a caregiver, I think I needed validation. I think I just needed that kind of thumbs up that that where my voice would be heard and where my voice was going to be used and what action we were going to do. And the Community Advisory Council is much like that too. So 12 members we want, we would like to have. We currently have six, so doing some recruiting there and selection. And that's been difficult. It's 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 really difficult to, uh, to go out and uh, rather than just send a call, how do you go out and form a relationship with people and orientate them to the work and, and orientate them to kind of have an expression of interest and put them in an area that they may have interest and in, in a position that they may have as, an interest in. Uh, then we have the engagement working group here. And again, I just want to kind of say that that's that provider and uh, patient family caregiver co-design or, or collective approach where they really kind of uh, are influenced by each other. And uh, I guess the most important thing and rambling a little here, I feel, but I, I think it's in the sense because uh, 
in in some of these meetings and in a lot of what we do is that the space is short and we don't have a lot of time so how do you put your passion into five minutes so that's difficult but i want to say that one of the things that we did well at the start and it has been a wave throughout uh, the process in the four years is that uh, working group and initiatives, having a co-design approach. So having community mem members represented in the co-design. And when I talk about co-design, it's really getting people into the work at the earliest spot. And I know as providers, we tend to be cautious and careful bringing people in. It's sometimes have the approach where we don't want to bring people in if we're not quite sure what we're doing or if we're at this planning stage where the pieces just don't fit together. And for me, I'm going to say that there are patient family caregivers that have the capacity to be in that environment, have the capacity to help you uh, come up with the approaches and the uh, the way forward on that. And then as it develops, there's different levels of engagement. And for me, I was finding in my work that a lot of our team members in those organizations were looking at the different levels of engagement, that if you had different levels of engagement in throughout your work, that that was kind of a check in the box or that was well represented. but. I really want to kind of emphasize, I guess, in there is the co-design part, is that bringing patients, family caregivers consistently in that brainstorming, that starting initiatives, and that's uh, that the planning part, and then see how that evolves. And there's different parts of engagement. Uh, again, just in the sense of ensuring that uh, safe space is created, uh, that people are in a co-design model and that really I think patient family caregivers and providers there's an approach to capacity building uh yeah you can go to the next slide Julia so uh so thanks Dean I think I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm sorry to because I know this is there's so much to cover here but I do want to make sure that Lindsay has a chance to present her perspectives from from Mississauga so uh and I think there's there's lots going on in the chat too so let's uh if you don't mind Dean thanks so much uh and we'll move to to Lindsay please go thanks. ahead Lindsay uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Lindsay. I'm the executive director of Mississauga Health. And, and maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just move us forward, Julia, to the uh, next slide. Um, we, I, I think one of the things you'll you'll notice across all the Ontario health teams in terms of structure is that they are all different and the nomenclatures all vary, um, which is, is probably something to tackle for another day. But um, we, we have ours as the Community Health Advisory Network. And um, in Mississauga is an incredibly diverse, um, culture rich, um, with varying communities um, area of Ontario. And as a result, we really wanted to ensure that our, our, our PFAC, our CHAN, was reflective of the community that we serve. And in fact, I, I will say to my, my OHT colleagues or planning colleagues on the line, we had to do uh, two or three sort of separate outreaches and engagements to really get to the uh, Chan that we we wanted that was reflective of our community. It meant reaching out to um, commu small community partners who were embedded within neighborhoods that we don't typically reach because uh, after our first call out for patient family um, and community advisors, we took a step back and uh, it, it was pretty obvious it didn't reflect uh, necessarily the people we served. So it was a really important step to do that right. And it meant it took longer for us to build our community health advisory network. Um, we have structured it uh, that our community health advisor network has two co-chairs. That was a governance model that we worked through and supported the CHAN to develop themselves in terms of how they will decide on their co-chairs um, and uh, what, what that format and role will take. Uh, and we, what we did was assured our, our collaboration council, and I'll show you the structure in a moment, um, that the two co-chairs are represented as standing seats um, at our collaboration council. So we have two, along with representatives from other sectors um, and our and um, 
like hospital, long-term care, uh, community care, et cetera. They do meet monthly and have developed a work plan. And if we go to the next slide, Julia, you'll see a bit of what uh, their deliverables are that they're working on. We felt it was really important that our advisory network didn't just act as um, an ad hoc, uh, you know, fulfilling the goals that the OHT had set, um, but that they really had some independence in determining what their work plan was going to be to drive um, they effectively drive the strategy and work plan of the Ontario health team. So uh, they've been working on, on an engagement strategy around reaching out to communities. And you'll see the terms how we can. This is their words and, and their work that they have done. Um, really understanding how they can use data differently uh, to inform their planning. They have uh, worked to ensure that they're... they're um, uh, their Chan members are represented on all of the work streams that we have occurring and our our, our patients, families and caregivers are remunerated for the work uh, that they do in, in line with a policy that they co-created and was since adopted by our collaboration council. Um, and uh, they not only bring information that is valuable to defining the strategy for the OHT to us, uh, but we also use our Chan to support outreach back to our community so that we have a uh, bi-directional communication. If we go to the next slide, I'll just show you quickly our, our structure. Uh, so we do have our members. That is our, our broad membership uh, of our OHT. We have over 95 members of our Ontario health team. It, it's the largest OHT in the province. So there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of people there. Um, we do have advisory councils, uh, which are both uh, the CHAN and primary care. And as we know for the OHTs, the, um, you know, the difference uh, around OHTs is that they're really meant to be structured around primary care and patients, families and caregivers. So we've, we've developed those advisory structures. And you can see below all the work, the input planning and implementation work that we're doing where patients, families and caregivers are represented. So just quickly, Julia, I'll, I'll take one minute and just really quickly share the lessons learned. Um, we found it was really important um, as an Ontario health team when building our structures that we were clear on what level of engagement um, we were having with our with our patients, families and caregivers. So using the community engagement framework around input, collaboration, decision making, et cetera, so that we could be really clear with every sort of topic and engagement, what what we were planning to do with patient, family and caregiver feedback. Um, we really challenged ourselves to uh, bring patients and families and caregivers into decision making that typically we might not have in our system. And I, I can think of a, a meeting I was at recently, a, a rather sort of senior level system um, meeting where I think the comment is we don't need patients, families and caregivers yet. And I think we've really challenged ourselves to say, how do we bring them to the table all the time up front as with the rest of our system partners and support them to be there. The support to be there was really important. We have we we have built strategies and structures now to ensure that our our chairs of our planning tables, our project managers are meeting ahead of time with patients, families and caregivers before each meeting to ensure they have the tools, the resources they need to fully participate, um, because we know that that big meetings with with lots of um, lots of jargon and uh, acronyms can be really challenging uh, for anyone stepping into that. The financial investment was necessary, um, and as I mentioned, we do have that. The balance was important. I think Dean mentioned that, you know, we, we don't just want one patient, family, and caregiver and 35 uh, system planners and, and professionals, so we really do try to balance out the voice, and where we can't, um, our co-chairs have been, been trained uh, to ensure that they create space for our patients, families, and caregivers to provide feedback um, in a way when maybe they won't often. And I think really important learning is uh, you're going to make mistakes. We definitely made mistakes with how we engaged our, our PFAC and our CHAN. Uh, we misstepped. We we didn't have people at the table when we should have. We we didn't engage the right way. And we've taken those opportunities to really embed that in our practice in, in sort of an ongoing QI. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, really pushing ourselves to identify patients, families, and caregivers and remove the barriers so that they can support that act, that reflect our community really broadly. Um, so I'll stop there because I, I know we're out of time, Julia, but uh, thank you. Great. I'm going to, I've just stopped sharing uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Michelle, and I'm sorry we went over time. As you can see, a, a tremendous amount to cover here. And so I hope we have a chance to follow up on some of the um, specific points more fully, but over, over to you. Uh, so you took the words out of my mouth. Um, I think the, 
best indication of a rich and timely discussion is the amount of conversation that goes on in the chat and questions. So we will collate those. We will identify some action items. Of course, I'm in a hospital. We're having a code right now. Apologies all, um, but we will make this recording available and uh, follow up on action items and next steps. So thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everybody for joining uh, onwards and upwards.